Good evening from Tennessee Summit in Murfreesboro with some thoughts here about the first part of How College Affects Students, the epic text from Pascarella and Terenzini. The book begins by acknowledging the generally high regard in which Americans hold post-secondary institutions in this country. That seems like a really fitting way to begin. Because it's true, I think it was true in this 1991 edition, I think it's still true today. But as we seek to justify our existence and understand a little bit more about why we do the things that we do, we have some big questions. I think this is a great way to frame the work here. What evidence is there that individuals change during the time in which they are attending college? Again, an evidence question. Is the development the result of college attendance? Do different kinds of post-secondary institutions make a differential influence? What about different experiences within the same institution depending on the type of student who matriculates and progresses through that institution? Again, thinking about student types and student backgrounds, do all students have the same experience, the same results? And what are the long-term effects of college? This is an ambitious work. They explicitly say that they're attempting to synthesize all the available studies, and so far in the reading it seems that they have done so. But they are very quick to acknowledge that their evidence has a bias. And I began to wonder for a moment how valuable the work would be when they began by stating focuses largely on non-minority students of traditional college age attending four-year institutions full-time and living on campus. Because in almost every respect, that does not describe the student population that we are working with at Chattanooga State. However, as, a, as I will show here in a moment, there's a lot of good information anyway that I find to be very relevant to our work. The idea of development is defined. I think that's important. Uh, the development versus change, the definition given for development is that it involves changes in an organism, an organism that are systematic, organized, and successive and are thought to serve an adaptive function. So in other words, change could be for good or for bad. Change could be movement in any direction, but development is a series of changes that is along a continuum towards something better. A lot of time in the text was spent on Chickering's seven vectors. And the Chickering vectors were then criticized a bit, but certainly the most time here was spent uh, was spent here versus other developmental models. And I thought this was a helpful way to think about at least my preconceptions about what college is supposed to do. Uh, students are supposed to achieve competence, supposed to learn to manage their emotions, develop autonomy, establish an identity, freeing interpersonal relationships, establishment of freeing inter interpersonal relationships, purpose, and integrity. And again, even though there was criticism level that the Chickering model or the Chickering vectors, toward the end of that chapter, there was a lot of discussion about the similarities among all the models that were discussed. So, for instance, this quote, an emergence during the college years of self-understanding and awareness that one's feelings and behaviors may not always conform to some set of ideal standards. So most of the models agree that's something that's supposed to happen during college. An emergence of an understanding and appreciation of the roles of and obligations to other people in one's life and higher levels of growth that mark a progression, again that idea of development being along a continuum, mark a progression towards self-definition and integration. And although the authors don't necessarily explicitly embrace this, they do posit 
and throw out for our consideration the idea that the college years function as something of a developmental testing ground between adolescence and adulthood. And this made me begin to think, uh, as I finish this chapter, about if this is true, if traditional students are coming to college to accomplish all of these things that are really far beyond uh, the gaining of academic knowledge, our adult students come to us already having developed those, those senses of self. And so our adult student needs really are tremendously different, perhaps, than our traditional students' needs. And that's not something that I have personally been very sensitive to, I think, uh, over the years that I have worked in community college. Although our average age, uh, last time I checked, was about 28. Uh, you know, I, I do think that that idea that so much of the personal growth and development that would happen on campus during the life of a traditional age student, that's already happened and is in place and is, you know, students, adult students are set. <laughs> their, their sense of self is, is probably already pretty developed. And so that may be why adult students seem to be much more interested in just flying onto campus, taking their classes, and... Uh, and heading back out to deal with the rest of their lives. This is important. It's important that we believe and know that attendance at college helps students learn. If not, then why are we here? So I thought this was a, a an obvious quote, but an important quote that students do appear to make statistically significant gains during college. And that the, but it is important, as always, anytime we talk about statistics, we want to be careful about causation. And so the second quote here demonstrates that uh, increases in knowledge that occur during college may not be because of college. And so there were several studies that attempted to look at the change from PSAT to GRE scores in the same students. And this was maybe a little bit discouraging. It appeared from most of these that most of the achievement difference, although all students went up in achievement, that those who went up the most are the students who came in already at a good place, at a higher level. Interestingly, the effects of institutional characteristics on student learning were small and inconsistent. So I thought this was a good example given about diminishing returns, uh, that a library of three million books is not three times better than a library of one million books. Most students can be adequately served in anything they want to study uh, in a library of a million books. And it, it doesn't do any harm to throw two, two million more volumes in there, but it does not triple the quality of the library for most students. And so I think the idea here is that it really is possible for students to get a great education in a whole variety of settings, whether they're Ivy League or regional or community college, uh, and, and mainly has to do with students' level as they enter the institution, rather than the differences between institutional types. And this is something I picked up on because I've been having these conversations for my whole career, K-12 on into higher ed, the, the elements of a good teacher. And the text identifies uh, these, these elements here. What about a teacher's skill, the rapport that they're able to strike with students? How do they use their class time, their structure? How difficult are they? And, and you know, I, I think sometimes now we maybe talk about rigor and that. That's not necessarily a synonym, but it may be here. Their interaction with the students and then their feedback. How much information do they give students about their progress? And the text concluded that skill and structure, of all these, these are all important, but skill and structure, which are italicized here, are the most important elements. So good information from Pascarella and Terenzini. Uh, good introduction to the text. And I'm excited to read more.